Fitting a line to a set of data points might sound like a boring mathematical procedure, but there's a hidden beauty behind linear regression that hints at an intimate relationship between abstraction and reality. A relationship that endures timelessly, behind, between, and beyond every moment. Join me now on an adventure to uncover the beauty of linear regression. Dang, that was a good intro, huh? I'm excited about this video, let's do it. Consider the following scenario. We have some data points in an XY plane, and they follow an approximately linear pattern. It's not perfect, but it's approximate. There's a trend there, and we want to know what it is. So, given all the possible lines that might exist in the plane, we want to know what is the line that best fits our dataset. And, can we find a way to answer this question for a general set of data points? Can we discover a procedure where we put in some set of data points and it gives us the line of best fit? In order to answer this question, I want to show you a way of thinking about the set of all possible lines in the XY plane that you might not have seen before. Now you probably remember from high school algebra that a line can be written as y equals ax plus b. Okay, usually they say mx plus b, but we'll use a instead of m because it goes better with b. So, in that equation, there are two coefficients, a and b. a sets the slope of the line, how much it changes. As you step in x, it gets multiplied by a, and so your step in y is related to that a factor. So a is all about the slope of the line. And b is the y-intercept. That's the height along the y-axis when x equals zero, where the line intersects the y-axis. Now think about this. Of all the possible lines in the xy plane, you can uniquely specify a single line by specifying those two parameters, a and b. So, now imagine a different space, an abstract space, a space of metaphor. We'll call it the a-b space, it's a parameter space. And in this space lives the set of all possible lines you can have in the xy plane. But here, they don't take on their physical, linear, extended form. Rather, they exist as points on the plane. At first glance, this representation of the set of all possible lines in the xy plane as the space of points in our AB parameter space may seem hopelessly abstract. I mean, what are we possibly hoping to get out of this? <laughs> this is only a, a way of labeling lines after all, right? It's, it's just a, a construct that we've come up with. What, what do the points in the AB space have anything to do with their actual counterpart lines? Isn't this just a labeling scheme? Isn't this just a notational convention? Aren't we just playing word games here at the end of the day? You might think so, but, as we'll see in a moment, by doing physics on the abstract AB parameter space, we can get the result we're looking for in the real space. But before we can do physics on our abstract AB space, we first have to precisely specify what do we mean by a good line fit versus a bad line fit? How can we quantitatively compare? Well, there actually are a few different ways of doing it, and in some applications some ways may be better than others. But no matter what, we'll always want to look at what are called residuals. Now residuals are shown as um, these red lines in the plot on the right. In fact, you know, here, let's look at one plot for a second. Now here we're showing just one residual, one data point as an example. How do we calculate that residual? Well, first of all, definitions. The residual of a data point is how much higher or lower that data point is from the fit line. So for example, here we're looking at a data point that is higher than the, the line of best fit, and so its residual is a positive number. On the other hand, if the, line, if the data point were below the line of best fit, it would have a negative residual. And to calculate the residual, we just calculate the length of that line. So, let's take this example, let's call it x sub i and y sub i. So the data point we're looking at, we'll say it's the ith data point. Right, so it could be x sub 1, y sub 1, x sub 2, y sub 2, and so on and so on. Any data point in our data set, the general one is x sub i, y sub i. Okay, so to calculate the ith residual, it's just the y value of the data point, so y sub i, minus the y value of the line, at that data point's x value, right? So that's gonna be a times x sub i plus b. So to calculate the residual, it's y sub i minus a x sub i minus b. And that formula 
will form the basis of our ability to analyze how good of, uh, of a fit any particular line is to any particular data set. It's all about those residuals. So now back to the question of how can we quantitatively say how good a particular fit is to a particular set of data? Well, typically the most broadly applicable approach is to take the method of least squares, which is to say, let's say our measure of error is calculated by adding up the squares of all of our residuals. So for each residual, we square it, and then we add up all those numbers, and that is our error number. Now, some people call this an objective function, that's sort of the mathematical term, uh, because it's the, uh, the objective of the problem is to minimize the function. I'm not a huge fan of that terminology. I like to call it the error metric. Um, it's a bit idiosyncratic, but to me it makes more sense. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it the error metric for the rest of this video, just because it makes it easier to follow along with, with what's going on. Here's where things start to get interesting. Let's go back to our abstract AB parameter space and color it in with the values of that error metric. So as you watch that blue dot move through the AB parameter space and you see the line it corresponds to on the right plot, what you'll notice is that for most of the AB space, the error metric is in the red. So that means high error. Red is high error yellow and green is medium error, blue is low error. So naturally the line of best fit is going to be in that blue spot. And you can watch as that dot moves around the surface, you can look between the AB space and the XY space and you can see that, that correspondence between the amount of the error in the AB parameter space and how well the fit line aligns to the data in real space. We can think of our error metric as an error landscape in the AB parameter space. And if you look at the plot, because red is high and blue is low, you can think of that plot as a hill, or really like a valley, with blue at the bottom and red up on the sides, sort of like a canyon. Now, with any scalar field, meaning a field that has a single scalar numerical value at each point, so like the error metric that we're looking at, you can take what's called the gradient of the field, and this is a vector field which is defined as follows. Everywhere the vectors point uphill. They point in the direction of maximum slope, directly uphill. And the length of the vector corresponds to the steepness of the slope. So for any given hill, think of it as a topographical map, as the side of a hill or a canyon, the gradient is just that set of vectors that everywhere points directly uphill, and the steeper it is, the longer the gradient vector is. By the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, but as you look at the dot moving around in the AB parameter space, notice that how high up it is on the B axis directly corresponds to the height of the Y intercept of the line that it corresponds to. See? At every moment, on the left plot, the height of the blue dot equals the height on the right plot of the leftmost side of the line, <laughs> the Y intercept. Now, in the AB space on the A-axis, how far left it is is how negative the slope is, and how far to the right it is is how positive the slope is. And right in the middle, at A equals zero, you get a flat line. So as you're watching this, keep that in mind. As the dot moves higher up, so does the y-intercept. And as the, as the dot moves from left to right, the slope is going to change from negative to positive. The gradient is cool, but what's even cooler is the negative gradient. So this is the same exact thing as the gradient, but all of the arrows are just switched in direction. So instead of pointing directly uphill, now they point directly downhill. And as before, the longer the vector is, the steeper the slope is. So it's just a minus sign on the gradient. The negative gradient shows up all over the place in physics. For example, gravitational force is mass times the negative gradient of gravitational potential. Likewise, electrostatic force is charge times the negative gradient of the electric potential, also known as voltage. And so, what if we say that the negative gradient of our error metric is a kind of error force? And what if, instead of just sweeping this blue dot around this path in the AB space, what if we give it some initial position and velocity and then just let it go and let it bounce around 
in this a b box that we've defined here but let's use that gradient field to act as a force field on the blue dot and we'll also add a bit of friction so that eventually the blue dot will slow down and as you might expect that blue dot is going to roll to the bottom of the hill and it's going to end up at the optimal point where our error metric is minimized Let's watch that again because it was so satisfying. So this is known as the method of gradient descent because the dot descends down the gradient field. Um, and this method is very commonly used, it's very powerful. It has a few limitations though. In general, you want to avoid using gradient descent unless you absolutely have to because it is computationally intensive, it involves discrete steps, so the dot will jump from one place to another, and those steps have to be smaller than the curvature of your error landscape, otherwise you can kind of tunnel through things, and, and that's not so good. Also, gradient descent is susceptible to getting stuck in local optimum. Uh, so, for example, imagine a cup on the side of a hill. If you're just rolling down the hill, you might get stuck in the cup. Now, there's ways around this. You can imagine starting off with multiple dots and letting them all go down the gradient. And yeah, some will get stuck in local optimum, but you know, hopefully at least one of them will get into the uh, global optimum. Fortunately, our error landscape here is very simple. It just has one minimum value. And so gradient descent will work just fine. But also, because our error landscape is not super, super complicated, we can actually just use calculus to calculate the exact analytic solution where the gradient equals zero, which is where the dot ends up, and then we can completely sidestep all of this stuff about gradient descent. We can just code into a program, like here's the solution, here's where that gradient is zero, without having to actually iteratively walk through the space and land there. So I show you this gradient descent example to show you that doing physics in this abstract AB parameter space leads to us getting the correct answer for the line of best fit in real space, which is very trippy. It should keep you up at night because it's kind of like, how is it that there's this mutual interpenetration of abstraction and reality? But what's going on there? But anyway, um, not to go <laughs> off on a tangent too much. Uh, what we're going to look at next is how to actually precisely numerically, um, not numerically, but analytically calculate those um, that minimum value using calculus. Let's write out the equation for the error of a line that has been fit to a set of data. As we talked about earlier, to calculate this error, we're going to take all the residuals, square them, and add them up. So as you can see in the equation, our residuals are delta y, each one gets squared, and then we sum, the i index goes from 1 all the way up to n, where n is the number of data points. So we just add up the residual squared. Okay, now we can write out our residuals, and here in this equation, what I'm actually showing is the negative of the residual, but it gets squared, so it's fine. I like to write it in this way. You'll see later it leads to a prettier equation. So just notice this is like the minus sign. All the signs have been reversed, but it washes out when we square it. So, okay, so this is our equation of our, um, of our error, of a line fit. And notice, you can think of this as an error landscape in AB space, as we looked at earlier. If you focus on A and B as variables, and imagine that for some given data set, X, X sub i and Y sub i, these just are what they are, they're just numbers and we sum up over them. But if you imagine varying A and B, you get varying errors. And so that's what generates our error landscape. Now let's return to this idea of borrowing from nature, where force is often proportional to the negative gradient of potential. So let's call our error force, and this is kind of a colloquial term, this isn't actually what it's called in math, but we'll just call it an error force, and say it's the negative gradient of our error landscape. And then we should expect this force to push the blue dot towards the optimum value, which gives us the line of best fit. Okay, so let's write out the definition of the gradient. In a function of two variables, 
The negative gradient is just the negative vector whose first component is the partial derivative of the scalar field with respect to the first variable, and whose second component is the partial derivative of the scalar field with respect to the second variable. So this definition encodes that nature of always pointing uphill, or from the minus sign, pointing downhill, and uh, the length of the vector being proportional to the steepness of the slope at that point, because the partial derivative is the slope of the scalar field along each of those two directions. So this is sort of intuitively what you would expect for the definition of a gradient. What follows is a series of symbolic manipulations that might not at first glance seem super intuitive. That's just the nature of doing equations in math. But if you follow along and look at it in, in general, uh, try to see the general process and then maybe go back and watch it a few times, um, you'll get the gist of it. Of course, now if you're an expert in a, uh, vector calculus, this is no problem for you, but I assume maybe not everyone watching is and that is absolutely okay. So first, to calculate the gradient, we need to calculate those partial derivatives. Now you might remember from calculus how to do a derivative. You can do a partial derivative just by treating anything that isn't the variable you're differentiating with respect to as constant. But before we get there, one thing I'd like to point out about derivatives, whether they're derivatives or partial derivatives, is that this is a linear operator. Meaning, if we look at the equation, let's look at the first equation, partial e, partial a. We have this partial, partial a operator acting on what you'll notice as our error. Um, our error is in the brackets, it's the sum of the residual squared. And the first thing we can do right away is make the note that because the derivative is a linear operator, the derivative of a sum is actually the same thing as the sum of the derivatives. So that's a neat little trick that we can do, because I know sometimes if you see a sum inside a derivative, it, it's a little bit daunting. It's like, oh geez, what, what is this exotic function that we're differentiating? Um, so go, going ahead and putting the derivative operator inside the sum means that we just have to evaluate the derivative of each term in the sum. Okay, so let's do that. So first, if you look at the partial derivative of e with respect to a, you'll notice that inside the differential uh, brackets there on, on the right side of that top equation, we have the function axi plus b minus yi quantity squared. If we're differentiating with respect to a, then everything except a can be treated as a constant. And so if you work out the derivative, what you find is that partial e partial a is just the sum over twice uh, axi plus b minus yi quantity times x sub i. And you get that by the exponent 2 comes down and multiplies, and, the, and then a is multiplied by xi, so the factor of xi comes out. And so that's the first derivative. Now similarly, if we look at the second derivative with respect to b, we see that it's actually even simpler because b doesn't multiply by anything. So the derivative of, of the term that gets squared with respect to b, you don't get this kind of chain rule factor popping out. And if you just calculate that, what you end up with is 2 times this quantity axi plus b minus yi. So now let's package those into the definition of the gradient, which is that vector where it's negative partial e partial a, comma, partial e partial b. Okay, when we put it in a vector, we see that the negative gradient is this uh, vector quantity where the two terms are these sums that we just calculated for the partial derivatives. And we can go ahead and pull the sums out of the vector if we want to. I generally like to minimize the amount of sigma notation in an equation. So let's go ahead and pull that sum out, and, and now we can express the negative gradient as the sum over these vectors. So by definition, our so-called error force is the negative gradient of our error landscape. And so on the left side of the equation, we can replace the negative gradient of E with the force vector. And I put also the force vector as a function of A and B, just to drive the point home that this is a two-dimensional force vector field. Okay. Now, um, we can simplify the math a little bit. If you notice, we're summing over all these vectors, but both of the vectors have in common, but, sorry, both components of the vector have in common this term uh, quantity axi plus b minus yi. So we can pull that out as a scalar quantity on each vector. And now this simplifies our equation a little bit. We have that our force field is a sum over these x sub i comma 1 vectors, and uh, each vector is then just scaled by that, that scalar quantity. So that makes things look a little nicer. Okay, now the next step is we want to find the special point in AB space where our force field equals zero. When the error force is zero, 
we're at the bottom of the hill. That's the optimal point. And so if we can analytically solve for the values of A and B such that the error force is zero, then we can analytically solve the optimal point in AB space, which is equivalent to finding the line of best fit. Okay, so on this slide, uh, all I've done here is I'm showing on the left, we have force of A, B equals zero, zero. So both components are zero in all directions. The, there's no force. And that implies then that the equation for the force field as a function of A and B has to equal zero. Both of its components have to equal zero. And by the way, we have this factor of negative two. We can just drop that out. I mean, if you divide both sides of the equation by negative two, zero divided by negative two is still zero. So let's drop that out of the equations. Because this is a vector equation, we can break it up into two different equations, one for the first vector component and one for the second vector component. And what we have now is a system of two equations. In the first equation, we see that the sum of this quantity axi plus b minus yi times xi must equal zero. And in the second equation, we see that the sum of that quantity, now just on its own, no longer multiplied by xi, also must equal zero. Now keep in mind, because this is a sum, uh, xi takes on different values for each i index. So x1 is probably different than x2, is probably different than x3, uh, and so on. And in fact, it is different because uh, presumably we're measuring different <laughs> x, xi data points. So these equations might look similar, almost redundant even, but it's the presence of the xi term in that first equation that really makes these two genuinely separate equations. What I'd like to do now is break up these sums so that instead of one sum per equation, we'll have three sums per equation. The reason I'm doing this is that, well, one, sums are linear. So if you have a sum over things being added up, you can just write that as a sum of sums. You can break up sums. And now look what happens if we move A and B out to the front of the sums. Because bear in mind, A and B don't have any dependence on the index I, so we can move them out of the sum. They will scale the sums by the same amount, whether you include them in each term or whether you multiply the sum in total by those A and B factors. What we have here is very interesting. Um, if you look at it as a, a function or an equation on, on the variables A and B, and you look at these sum terms as just constants, because if you look at them, look, it's one of them has a xi squared term, one of them is the sum over xi, Another one's the sum over xi times yi, another one's the sum of yi. So these are just constants that relate to our data set. You can calculate them by evaluating their expressions and adding up over all the data points. Okay, well look, the third sum in each equation is negative. Let's make that positive by moving it over to the other side of the equal sign. What we have now is something that looks very much like it wants to be packaged into a matrix equation. I'll emphasize the variables a and b, and uh, you can kind of see this. these two equations have almost a square-like uh, arrangement, and so it's very natural to encode them as a matrix equation. So let's go ahead and do that. And if it's not super obvious right away how this matrix equation is equal to the equation that we were just looking at, if you go back a couple times and... and and remember that to do the matrix multiplication, you, you, uh, you take the row of the matrix and times the column of the vector. You can see that this is the same thing as the system of equations we were just looking at, but now it's packaged as a matrix equation, and so we can leverage the power of matrix algebra to solve for A and B. In fact, right away, we can just invert, so th th there's that big matrix times A and B, just multiply both sides of the equation by the inverse of that matrix, and you end up directly solving for A and B. It's the inverse of that matrix times that column vector. By the way, like I was saying earlier, I like to reduce the amount of sigma notation in an equation if necessary, or if I can. And so we can also write those equations as the sum over these smaller matrices, and then you invert that sum of matrices, and then you multiply it by the sum of these column vectors. I think that's a pretty elegant way of putting the equation. And while we're simplifying, look at the column vector on the right side of the equation with the xi, yi, yi terms. Let's go ahead and pull a yi out of that because we can uh, pull a scalar quantity out. And we can just write that as yi times this quantity of uh, the vector xi and 1. Now one more final note on this particular equation. Um, in the matrix xi squared, xi, xi1, that's actually the outer product of that xi1 vector that appears on the right side of the equation. 
That observation really doesn't help us at all in this particular context, but in general, you want to be on the lookout for that kind of pattern um, because that can give you insight in other more complicated problems. Okay, so there you have it. This equation is a matrix equation where if you have some set of data points, some xi, yi set of data points, follow this procedure, add up these matrices, invert, multiply by this vector, and then you will get your a and b numbers, which give you the line y equals ax plus b, which best fits the data. This applies for any data set in the plane. It's a general, powerful, very quick procedure. You can calculate this so much faster than doing gradient descent. You don't have to worry about numerical errors or getting stuck in a local minimum or anything like that. It's just a direct analytic solution for how to find the line of best fit. But notice that the derivation of this comes from this thought process of thinking about an error landscape and thinking about an error force and doing physics in our abstract AB space. So now we can reduce it to this algorithm, to this procedure, but in order to get there, we had to go on this conceptual journey, and it's the conceptual journey that really matters. You don't have to remember the equation that's on the screen right now. In fact, it'd be kind of weird if you memorized it, honestly. But <laughs> having seen the process that we went through in this video, I hope you'll remember that general process. I hope you'll remember the visuals and, and the thoughts and the reasoning and the abstraction, because that's really what matters at the end of the day. And that is the beauty of linear regression. If you liked what you just watched and you want to learn more about linear regression, it's your lucky day. I wrote you a Python code, and I hope you'll check it out. If you're interested, just download Anaconda, and it'll download uh, Spider, and then run the Spider IDE on your computer. Spider's awesome, I love it, it's what I use. And then just run this code. And here I'm showing the whole code, it's only like a dozen lines. Now normally I like to be more verbose with my comments in the code, this was written kind of densely so I could fit it all on one screen. Um, just to show in the video, but anyway, uh, what it'll do for you is it'll create an example data set, and then it'll do the very same uh, linear regression algorithm that we derived in this video, and it'll calculate the line of best fit for that data, and then it'll plot it. And so you can play around with those numbers on the line that's like A underscore B underscore N and R. You can change the slope of the linear trend, you can change the y-intercept, change the number of data points and the amplitude of randomness you want sprinkled into the data, and just play around with it and, and you know, get a feel for it. Um, those lines, the ones starting with SX2, SX, SXY, and so on, those are the sums over the data set. The line starting with M comma V is where we construct our matrix and our column vector and evaluate the, um, or I'm sorry, we evaluate the matrix equation in the following line with A and B, where we calculate our A and B of best fit. And then the subsequent lines make a plot that show you the whole thing, the data points, the residuals, the line, it's all there. So anyway, please download this code, play around with it, um, copy and paste those regression lines. You can, you'll use them over and over again in general, if, if literally in Python, if you ever have a data set X and a data set Y, those three lines of code, it's like super fast linear regression. It's funny, I did a test, I was curious. How long would it take to run those lines of code? Just the ones starting with SX2 through A comma B, in other words, just the linear regression algorithm. So I gave it a million data points and it took 235 milliseconds. Isn't that crazy? I, I read that a blink of an eye is about a third of a second. So <laughs> if you give this thing a million data points and you ask it, what is the line of best fit through those data points? It'll calculate that for you in the blink of an eye with 100 milliseconds to spare. That is the power of using calculus to derive these these ultra efficient ways of getting directly to the optimum and by the way just on this topic i know this video is going long um but hey if you've stuck around this far you hear me out for another minute 
I want to generalize the concepts we've discussed in this video and point out the fact that in really any optimization problem, you'll follow the same procedure. Think about it. What was the first thing we did? Well, we're looking for one particular line in the set of all possible lines. And so the first thing we need to do is represent the set of all possible lines in a visual way. Now, then the question is, which one's the best? So the second thing we need is a way of coloring in that visual space of all possible lines with a way that tells us which one's the best so we can see it. Then we need a procedure for getting to that. And there's a few different ways. Gradient descent typically always works, but it's costly. But if we use calculus, we can get to that optimum analytically, and then we can create these super fast algorithms that just get right there. Now, in reality, it's not always so simple. Sometimes you're dealing with more random or more chaotic data, and you don't always have a clean analytic solution. So in future videos, we'll talk about more generalized forms of regression. Um, maybe we'll get into gradient descent a little bit more, and we can explore those various things and, and get to more real world, um, more complicated problems. But I think at the end of the day, if you want a distillation of how to do an optimization problem, there's probably no better example than linear regression. It's just the essence of, of optimization. And you can take this idea and you can go with in so many different directions with it, explore so many different avenues and possibilities. So anyway, I am rambling on at this point, but look, if you liked this video, if you're feeling violently complimentary, feel free to slap a like, um, subscribe if you're into this, and I'll see you in the next one.